Whose broken window is a cry of art, success that winks aware as elegance, as a treasonable faith, is raw, is sonic, is old-eyed premier, our beautiful flaw and terrible ornament, our barbarous and metal little man. I shall create, if not a note, a hole, if not an overture, a desecration, full of pepper and light and salt and night and cargoes. Don't go down that plank if you see there's no extension, each to his grief, each to his loneliness and fidgety revenge. Nobody knew where I was and now I am no longer there. The only sanity is a cup of tea. The music is in the minors. Each one is having different weather. It was you. It was you who threw away my name. And this is everything I have for me. Who has not Congress, Lobster, Love, Luau, the Regency Room, the Statue of Liberty, runs a sloppy amalgamation, a mistake, a cliff, a hymn, a snare, and an exceeding sun. Hello, and welcome to Words That Burn, a podcast about poetry. Each week, I read a poem, look at its inner workings, and hopefully show you what makes it tick. This week's poem is Boy Breaking Glass by Gwendolyn Brooks. Before I begin, I have a suggestion. Try to find a copy of the poem somewhere so that you can read along. It tends to make things a little bit easier. Gwendolyn Brooks published her first poem at the age of 14 and continued to publish for the rest of her life. She grew up black during the 1920s and 1930s and existed in an America that was devoid of any kind of rights for herself or for other members of her race. Despite this, Brooks was lucky and managed to receive an education However, she was aware that such luxuries were rarely afforded to her peers. Much of her work was created through the lens of this observed inequality. Brooks constantly wrote about the black experience, her words increasing in political nature later in her career. Her poetry raged against the oppression of black people and their culture, as well as constantly ensuring that the record on her race was set right that black people were in no way inferior to any other race in the eyes of the public, but most of all, in their own eyes. To quote the critic Kathy Rugoff, her poetry, novel, autobiographies, and short prose works are categorized by an intense awareness of the African-American experience, women's roles and feminist perspectives, and literary tradition. Brooks responded to major events during her lifetime, including World War II, the struggle for civil rights, the murders of African-American leaders, race riots, and daily life in segregated urban America. To truly understand this poem, its dedication must be taken into account. Just below the title are the words for Mark Crawford, from whom the commission. This poem was inspired by a conversation that Brooks had with her friend, the editor and writer, Mark Crawford. Crawford challenged Brooks to create a poem that spoke to African-American youth across the United States. More specifically, young black men living in socio-economically deprived conditions. Brooks took on this challenge by penning this poem, Boy Breaking Glass. It is an incredibly challenging poem with imagery bordering on the abstract and surreal. Vivid visuals which morph easily from one message to the next throughout. Within this earlier poem, around 1967, we see hints of the poet that Brooks would one day become. The very first stanza challenges the reader with coded language and whirlwind imagery. Whose broken window is a cry of art, success that winks aware as elegance, as a treasonable faith, is raw, is sonic, is old-eyed premier, our beautiful flaw and terrible ornament, our barbarous and metal little man. There is an immediate everyman quality granted to the subject of the poem by the word whose. This everyman tactic allows Brooks to address all her peers at once. The broken window here is transformed into an unusual canvas of sorts. The following lines are marked by a parenthesis, indicating an aside of sorts. A subtle observation by Brooks imparted to her reader. The success she speaks of is a nod to the fact that this cry of art is true creation. And despite what people may say about high versus low art, to her mind, 
it is up there with the best. The boy who has made this broken window shows intelligence, potential and promise. He is, in every sense, the real McCoy as a creative and artist. This act of art is defined as a treasonable faith, more like a forbidden act. The making of art in the black community at this time somehow a betrayal of working class roots. This is no stretch in interpretation, as Brooks herself was an educated black woman who often received judgement and backlash from her community as a result. Calls that she had turned her back on the community, especially in her earlier career. This is well documented and she often spoke of how it affected her later on. So in this line, there is a camaraderie shared between Brooks and Boy, a recognition of a kindred spirit. Following that, the fury of oppressed black expression is documented. Is raw, is sonic, is old-eyed premier. It is raw or unrefined due to the fact that African Americans have little or no access to the institutions that would allow them to hone any art they chose to pursue. It's loud and sonic due to the anguish behind it the motivation of pure anger. Finally, the old-eyed premier has two possible illusions. It's important to note here that it is spelt in the French, indicating the word first. To me, this is a reference to the ancestral African Americans that came before, watching this young man undertake his craft with their old eye. But other critics have noted that this young man has possibly thrown his rock through a window of an old building, an institution, one of the first, a monument to the society that oppresses him. And as he smashes the glass, it can only look on, old-eyed. Abstraction takes over, as Brooks then begins to describe the boy himself. Our beautiful flaw and terrible ornament. Our barbarous and metal little man. Within this young man, there is seen a whole community and their actions. The flaw of raising such an angry youth failed by so much in society. The terrible ornament that speeches are written about and how every action taken in protest is done for the children. Finally, there is a creature that is forged from such turbulent times, barbarous, filled with anger and energy, and made of metal because that is what the world has required of him. He has to be strong and unflinching in the face of adversity. From here, the boy screams to anyone who will listen. I shall create, if not a note, a whole. If not an overture, a desecration. His statement is one of defiance. It is coupled with a recognition that he will never be classically trained. He will never be allowed the same route as his white artist counterpart. So he will invert what is expected of art. He chooses to abandon the classic note in favor of destruction instead. He will not write an overture a piece of praise in favour of anything, but opts instead to destroy those things he hates. In the next few lines, Brooks zooms out to look at African Americans as a whole once more. Full of pepper and light, and salt and knife, and cargoes. Don't go down the plank if you see there's no extension. Each to his grief, each to his loneliness and fidgety revenge. Nobody knew where I was, and now I am no longer there. There's an interesting amount of wordplay in that initial couplet, salt and pepper being a very simple analogy for white and black, which is further compounded by night and light. Both these simplistic pairs serve to remind the reader of what's really going on here. This is a poem highlighting division and inequality. These lines have a secondary meaning laced into them as well. The boy full of vigor or pepper and potential being the light while also housed within the history of his people. Nights filled with salt air where they were transported as cargo across the sea, this trauma adding even more fuel to his creativity. Then comes another proclamation from the titular boy. He speaks of refusing to walk the plank, a cry against accepting one's fate. Don't choose a path if you see no benefit. His subsequent words are yet another inversion of classical art. John Donne once said that no man is an island, in a call to recognise that humanity needs each other. In contrast to this, the words the boy offers are a cynical rebuke. Each man, in his eyes, must serve their own needs. Each is left to struggle with their impulses, emotions and wants, their fidgety revenge. The final line of the set, nobody knew where I was and now I am no longer there, seems to say that the boy has left those who neglected him behind. He has struck out on his own, 
determined to live by the mantra he has just outlined. Six couplets follow. The only sanity is a cup of tea. The music is in the minors. Each one other is having different weather. It was you who threw away my name, and this is everything I have for me. More wordplay dominates the first pair of lines. The sanity of tea is a possible scoffing line towards the old colonial idea of the civilizing force of England or France on Africa. Though, to be perfectly honest, I found it very difficult to find any kind of explanation for this line. What is more obvious, however, is the next line. The music is in minors. This is clever, as minors refers both to one of the two keys that music is played in, the major and minor keys, but also a reference to the fact that our boy is both young and a member of a minority group. It is Brooke's recognition that youth is where the new wave of creativity, the music, will come from. She goes on to show that each child is unique, each moulded by different circumstances or different weather. Yet another pushback against the profiling of the time. The boy wrestles back the narrative of the poem, reasserting his agency in a final cry. They took his name, by which it is meant that they branded him and his peers in the same fashion, creating a demonized, monolithic image of the black child. They took away any kind of individuality, and so the boy's only recourse is destruction, expression through chaos. The true isolation of the black creative is explored in the final stanza. Who has not Congress, Lobster, Love, Luau, the Regency Room, the Statue of Liberty, runs, a sloppy amalgamation, a mistake, a cliff, a hymn, a snare, and an exceeding sun. The boy is locked in both an act of protest and creation, a rage against the oppressive society that affords him no quarter. However, his experience is not unique. There are many young African Americans in his position. Brooks lists off the things that will never be within their reach. Congress, Lobster, Love, Luau, the Regency Room, the Statue of Liberty, Runs. Lofty institutions like Congress and the famous hotel Regency Room are not available to black people. They dare not even dream of setting foot in them at this time. The Statue of Liberty is revealed to be a lie, as the liberty she offers does not extend to them. There are other more obscure words, like runs. I've always taken this to mean a political run, a run for office, which again, no black person will be allowed to have at this time. Even concepts like love, both in the public and private sense, are forbidden to them. They elude her community. The attempts at society to include the black community, and more so their decision to enslave them in the first place, is lambasted next. A sloppy amalgamation. A mistake. A cliff. Each full stop, hammering the point to the reader like a gavel striking the bench. This possibly echoes some of the criticism of attempts at integration during this time. And society finds itself on the precipice of huge disruption as a result. Despite all this, there is hope encapsulated in the boy. The words flow, punctuated by commas, as opposed to the jarring full stops we've just heard. This time, he is a hymn, a song that sings the hope of salvation. He is an exceeding sun, once more recognizing the blinding light of potential that may one day shine from the next generation of African Americans. So why this poem? Gwendolyn Brooks has always been recognized as an incredible poet and a wonderful voice for the black community. She wrote many incredible poems, and yet this one, to me, is a masterwork. It is one of her most ambitious in terms of imagery, structure, and layout. It has been noted that Brooks' poetry, usually consistent in pacing, meter, and form, is completely different here. It is completely fractured, it is disjointed, flowing in some areas and cracking in others. It's impressive to me because it invokes linguistically the fracturing of glass. Her poem literally mimics the imagery it speaks of. The poem is also a turning point for Brooks' work, Prior to 1967, she had been experimenting with how best to represent the black experience, trying many different methods and styles. After 1967, however, it's been shown that her work became distinctly politicized. So the poem here shows a black man exercising his defiance of an unjust world, in an act of simultaneous destruction and creativity, while Brooks is doing the exact same. 
She is committing an act of defiance through art, and that bond of camaraderie that I mentioned at the very beginning of this analysis takes on an even deeper level. I will point out, as always, that this is my interpretation, and as such, very much up for debate. If you'd like to talk to me about it, or if you have a poem you'd like me to read and analyse on this podcast, you can get in touch in loads of places. Send me an email at wordsthatburnpodcast at gmail.com. Find me on Instagram at wordsthatburnpodcast, where I upload helpful study guides and bonus material. You can find the show notes for this episode, complete with references to every single bit of research, at wordsthatburnpodcast.com. This episode was written and produced by me, Benjamin Colopy. The music for this week's episode was provided by Scott Buckley and is used under Creative Commons license. As always, I really appreciate you spending time with me, and I hope that you'll hear from me again soon.